Good evening, family. Um, someone please just make sure that uh, Brother Luke's phone is on. <laughs> So, um, Maria didn't give me a chance to, to uh, testify just now, so I've got a quick testimony, uh, if, uh, if you'll allow me. So, uh, a while ago, there was a paid news ad that said that Jesus, the Son of God, was dead and his body was stolen. Uh, but I am here this morning to say that over the past 20 years, Jesus has appeared to me a few times, and he has said to me in a letter called Matthew 28, that he is preparing a place for us and he is very alive. Amen? Amen. 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 Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for this, the body of Christ tonight. We thank you for this gathering. Thank you, Father God, that we are here to, to hear your heart for us tonight, Father. We, we did not come tonight here, Lord, to, to hear man speak did not come to be entertained. We did not come to, to, to show ourselves off, Lord. We came here because we, we desire to worship you, Lord, and worship you in spirit and in truth. We are here tonight, Father God, because there simply is nothing um, else on the face of this earth that is worth worshiping more than you, Lord. There's nothing, Lord. And so here we are, Father God, and, and, and our small little insignificant lives, our, our small little lives that mean absolutely nothing unless you touch them, Lord. We are here tonight to give those lives to you and to say, Father, please take these lives and make something absolutely great and godly with them. So as we get into your word tonight, Father, we pray that the Spirit of Jesus Christ will do his perfect work in our hearts, minds, bodies, souls, and spirits. Sink the truth of the word of God deep in us, Lord, so that nothing and no one can take it from us ever again. We pray and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Family, if you want to follow with tonight, we're going to be reading two scripture verses in... Um, the New Testament, we're going to be starting off in the book of John. So John chapter 8, verse, if you don't, just go to John chapter 8, we'll, we'll get to the verse now. Before we get into that, I want to start off this, this evening by asking you a question. And the question is, plain and simple, I love to be challenged in life because challenges cause us to grow. Amen? So I love to be challenged and then... Um, I love to challenge God's people as well because I know that there are some of God's people that are bold and courageous that will take the challenge and stand up and run with it. Amen? Amen. So the challenge tonight is, or maybe not a challenge, but the question tonight is, is there anything at this very moment in your life, right now, where you are sitting, that is causing you with everything inside of you to seek the Lord day and night without stop? <coughs> or are you on a Christian honeymoon stage where, where everything just works? You can pray once and you get things twice. Where, where, where you read the word of God and you understand it immediately. You don't have to go to anyone to, to, to ask for an interpretation. So... My question is, are you at a place in your life and, and a walk with Christ where something is happening in your life that is causing you to rely on the Lord fully? Like, not only two hours in the morning, the whole day. And so, I want to start by, by just giving you an example, family. When I, I met Cherise and we started in the ministry, it was... It, man, it was sunshine and roses. It was, it, it was like the day and night was swapped and there wasn't a night and it was just permanently day and the Lord was walking with us. He was holding our hands. He was blessing us with gifts. We were healing, not we. The Lord through us was healing people and we were prophesying and we were giving words of wisdom. 
wisdom and insight and knowledge and truth and, and, and we were speaking in tongues and interpret other people's tongues. It was, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And then, and then, there came a time where unbeknown to me, we were living right next to a 7 foot 135 kilogram bodybuilder that was a drug lord in that town. And I was working under the Satanists and the Lord was converting Satanic priests and princesses and, and soldiers and, and we were hitting the craft hard. And the Lord was bringing them to salvation. And, and can I tell you something, family? If you want to see a radical, radical Christian, it is somebody that has been in Satanism that has fully given their Lord, life to the Lord. They drop everything. And they serve the Lord with everything inside of them. And so, unbeknown to me at that stage, this drug lord living right next to us, that could look out of his kitchen window onto our um, um, bedroom window, he was one of the, 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 the big Macs of the Satanists in the town. And we were taking his business. And so he started spewing threats to, to us, especially to me. At that stage, my wife was pregnant with um, Faithy, and um, as, as she was leading to um, month nine uh, in, in the pregnancy, they one evening, for those who haven't heard this, for those who've heard this, please just um, for, forgive me, just for the sake of the message. One evening in a car park, this guy, this drug lord, sent three hitmen to kill me. Long story short, I'm still here. Amen. 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 Why? Because Jesus lives. Amen. Amen. The Bible teaches us in the book of Psalms, if I'm not mistaken, not to touch God's anointed. Not. Do anything else on the face of this earth, but do not touch God's anointed. You are looking for trouble that you can't sort out. And so the three hit men came, um, massive monster guys um, told me what they're going to do. I told them a different story and they left me that, that night. And then they came back a while after that and they said, okay, you know what? Don't, don't you worry about it. We know your wife is pregnant and she's going to give birth soon. We'll just kill your, your child in the hospital. That's it. And so family, long story short, my child is still here. Amen. Do not touch God's anointed. Let me say this, family. When we, when this all came to, to, to my knowledge, when I learned about this, and I knew that this guy was watching us, and, and, and our every move, he knew when we went shopping, when we went to church, he, he, he knew everything. He had watchers everywhere. He sent satanic high priests to sit in our church. And chant in our church. Thankfully, the Spirit of God is awake and alert and alive. Thankfully, some of us choose to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God showed us who it is. We went and stood at the back of the church and prayed that Spirit out of them. They couldn't leave that church that day the same way they came in. And so they were converted. And family, the, the, the moral of the story is, is that when it was in the honeymoon stage of, of our ministry, everything was shana -na and fine, and, and you, you know, it felt, felt like you were permanently walking on clouds, and oh, it was amazing, okay? And then the threat started coming, the persecution started coming, they wanted to imprison us and what, and family, that, that time is where I learned to pray straight through the night. Straight through the night. Because they would say to us, don't, don't worry, you know, you have to sleep somewhere along the line. <laughs> really? You know my God. He keeps you awake to spend time with you. When you are sleeping. And so that's where I learned to pray. And family, that's why I'm asking tonight. Is there something in your life that is keeping you awake so that you can pray? Is there something in your life that is 
forcing you day and night to concentrate on Christ. Because if there isn't, maybe we must call something like that. Amen? Because family, if we go through the word of God, none of our brothers and sisters in the word had it easy. None of them. They, the letter we are going to read tonight was written out of a prison. Most probably with half a broken arm, a, 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 a severed jaw, a, a teeth out, cut open. You get what I'm saying, family? And we are sitting here this evening and we have the blessing of holding this beautiful Amen. word in our hands. And if you read the New Testament church when it started, at first, they spewed threats. They got them together, you know, with their counsel, the, the clever people, the people with the, the good clothes and the, the nice smelling, um, you know, fragrances. And, 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 they, and they said to them, stop this. Stop this. Or something very bad is going to happen. What did our brothers do? Thank you. Walked out the door and carried on. Amen. If my God does not tell me to do it, I don't do it. Amen? Yeah. If my God tells me to do it, I do it. Amen? Amen? And so, this is what is happening here now. Is we're going to read a letter of exactly this. So family, if you are sitting in a position where you are constantly being forced to call out to the Lord, I am telling you tonight, you're in a good place. You're in a good place. We are permanently supposed to be in the presence of the Lord. Permanently. And I asked the Lord when I came to salvation, I said, Lord, if something happens in my life and I become complacent and lazy and I move away from you, call me back, please, Lord. And the Lord has been faithful. It's, it's been happening. There's my wife over and over and over again. We don't get time to rest, family. Because the Lord is constantly calling us to attention. John chapter 8 verse 31. Listen what Jesus says to the important people. He says to them, to the Jews. You have it there? To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Did we hear that family? Not the government will set us free. Amen. Amen? Amen. Not an organization or an institution yes. will set us free. Amen. Listen clearly family. Not even a church yes. will set us free. But the truth yes. is the only thing that will set us free. What is Jesus talking about here? Plain and simple, family. The Lord, when he wrote the gospel, wrote it so that children can understand. It is not complicated. When Jesus says the truth will set me free, what he is saying to me is, my boy, always be open and honest with me. Always. You can't hide anything from me. You can't. And the more I try and hide something from the Lord, the more I will not be set free, the more I'll be captive. Yes. But the more I go to Jesus and say, Lord, I am battling with this. I don't have any self-control in this area. I don't have any patience in this area. Lord, I hate this person. Yes. Yes. Truth. The truth, when the truth is out there, it's like switching a light on and you can see everything. Yes, That's when the Lord comes and says, my boy, my girl, you were truthful and honest. This is now where I'm going to. Amen. This is where your freedom comes. And so we go from there to 2 Corinthians, to a letter that Paul writes to the churches. While he is in chains, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen what the Lord says to us here, family. Points again. The Lord gave us, gave us points in this. Number one, point number one. <clears throat> Therefore, 
since through God's mercy we have received this ministry, we do not lose heart. Amen? If you see someone step into a church and claim to have a calling and a ministry, and then two weeks, three, four, a month, two months later, they fade away and they're not in the church anymore. Amen? Amen. It was a self-appointed ministry. But yeah, Paul teaches us that therefore, since through God's mercy, we have received our ministries, because of that, we don't lose heart. Amen? We, if it is a self-appointed ministry and the persecution comes, you're going to lose heart and you're going to move away. But if you stay stuck on the rock of salvation, then we know that ministry comes from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Point number one, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Family in Jesus, I am standing here right now prophesying. I'm going to prophesy a truth tonight to my family in Jesus. Not very long from now, this world is going to change radically. Radically, family. We as God's people are going to lose things that we are sitting here tonight thinking we will never lose. I'm prophesying it tonight, family. Write today's date down and know that the Lord has spoken to us so that when it happens, that we will not lose heart. That we will stay stuck to the ministries that the Lord has given us to be able to advance God's kingdom. Family, can you imagine waking up tomorrow morning and the government sending out an announcement stating that every single person that is a member of any Christian church or society in New Zealand, we are immediately freezing your bank accounts. Are we going to lose heart? Or are we going to stick to what the promises and the truth of what the Lord has given us? Family, please don't sit here tonight and think to yourself, it won't happen. It's coming. It's coming, family. It has happened in other countries already. You know, in South Africa, there is, according to me, an ungodly country. A lot of people claim to be Christians. 82% of the South African census claims to be Christians. But the prisons are full. The nightclubs are full. The the bottle stores make the most money. The, The drug movement in South Africa is rampant. How can you say 82% is Christian? And then the churches on a Sunday is empty. You know, family, in a country like that, in one of the major banks, four years ago, they started chipping people in the right hand that works at the bank to be able to enter into the bank. And they're already talking about putting your bank account onto that chip. My mom spoke to me two weeks ago about it. It's here, family. We can't escape it. It's coming. The Lord prophesied. My question tonight is, are we ready when it hits? The Lord has been trying to prepare us for a while now. Have we opened our ears and heard what he is saying? There's going to come a time, family, where I don't have a job anymore because this government won't allow it. We won't have churches anymore. They'll change this church into a nightclub or op shop or whatever they want. We won't be able to gather like this anymore. Are we ready, family? Are we in the presence of God so that when this happens, excuse my language, we don't absolutely freak out and lose our minds and not know which direction to go into. But to know Jesus is king. This happened to our apostle brothers 2,000 years ago. Why would it not happen to us? Why? Why are we more special than them? So, it starts off. Verse 1. Verse 2 it says, Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways 
We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. What does the scripture say? Again, plain and simple. Paul is saying here that even while I am in prison, even when I was with you, I did not distort the word of God. I did not say something to you from the word of God and you didn't understand what I meant. He said, I spoke plain truth to you. Plain truth. Follow Jesus or die. It's a plain truth. That's it, family. And so he says, that's what we are to do as well. We take it tonight as we took it this morning. Paul is writing this letter to us. Yeah? He's writing it to Alton Baptist Church. Yeah. And Christian Harvest Center. Verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Family, what is a veil? A veil is something that covers your face, covers your eyes. Um, we've seen veils all over the place these days, eh? Yes, Everywhere. You go to Countdown, there's veils all over the place. Can't see people's faces. What he is saying here is, is that to the unbeliever, to the world, the truth of Jesus Christ is veiled. It's covered. They can't see the truth. But we are the ones that through the way we live, we can remove that veil. Amen. Because they get to trust us, family. My, my, my wife and, and myself, in the way that we lived, in, in, in our life, family, friends, non-friends, what, whatever, people persecute you, they slander you, they speak ill of you, they, but then something happens in their life and they fall into an addiction, or they get pregnant outside of wedlock, or they, they, they lose their business, or what, who do they run to for help? They run to us sitting here, family. Because they know that if there's anybody that's connected to the living God that can help them, it's us. Because we permanently speak about our first love, which is Jesus. And we speak about Him in a way that makes Him so real. So real. He's permanently with me. Permanently talking to me. Permanently leading me. Then they run to us. That's where that veil falls off. The word goes on. Um, verse 4. The God of this age, for those who don't know, is Satan, is the enemy that's ruling on, on earth today. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that is displayed. It displays the glory of Christ, whom is the image of God. The enemy has blinded them. And, and, and look, family, where has he blinded them? Their minds. He has blinded their minds. We've seen it in the past two years. Family, you cannot go, I don't, I don't even want to mention that name, and please don't shout it out either. There's nowhere that you can go, anywhere in our beautiful country, and not stand in front of a poster with a name on it. That name has blinded the minds of people. You mention that name in conversation, and people go blind with fear and anxiety and stress and worries and, and absolutely blind. So this, he's been successful here. I'm not giving him credit, but it's, he's been successful. Verse 5. For what we preach is not of ourselves. If it was, family, it would have fallen flat a long time ago. Amen. So what we preach is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord Amen. and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. Yes. That's Family, anything other than me proclaiming I'm a servant of Jesus, I'm making a mistake. Yes. Amen. Yes. That's all I am. I'm a servant to Christ. Amen. I'm his servant. That's it. I'm a fisherman. That's my title on this earth. 
A servant for Jesus. Nothing else. And then the word goes on. Verse 6. For God who said let light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. We family have received the light. We've had that light bulb moment. Yes. The world hasn't yet. They're still dwelling in darkness. The, the, the word of God started off in Genesis 1 by saying, in the beginning, there was nothing. It was void and it was empty and it was dark. It was dark. And then Father God called his son Jesus and he made everything light. Amen. Amen. And then we go to verse 7. But we have these treasures in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. What does Paul mean here? Jars of clay. Jars of clay that can, that, that, that can break easily. We are very fragile, family. Very fragile. Today I'm standing before God's people and I'm on fire and I'm preaching and I'm teaching and I'm looking. And tomorrow I get a phone call and the phone call says, Jacques, you know, it's your doctor here. I'm sorry to tell you that you have liver cancer. Fragile. Man down. Amen. Why are you doing this to me, Lord? Oh, shame me. Shame. No, Lord, no. Fragile family. Jars of clay. And so he's saying here that even though we are fragile, he has given us the power from God, not from us. Amen. Then it goes further, verse 8. We are hard pressed on every side. Are you, family? Are you? At this moment? Or do you still have freedom? Can you say what you want, when you want, go where you want, speak to? Are you hard pressed on every side? Not yet, family. Look what it's saying here. It's coming. Hard pressed on every side. There's no, there's no movement. They are, they pressing you. Hard pressed on every side. But we are not crushed. It says perplexed, but not despaired. Persecuted, but not abandoned. You know how many people, family, I have counseled in my walk with the Lord. That has been persecuted and they think the Lord isn't with them anymore. That, that, it's not like that. That's when the Lord is with you. Is in the persecution. When, when Peter and them were sitting in prison, bound in chains, that's where the Lord was. Sent the angel, wake them up. Slap Peter, stand up, get dressed. What you doing? The chains are off, move. We must preach. Yeah. So, but, um, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Family, if we have to lie down every single time we are struck because we serve the Lord, um, nothing will happen in God's kingdom. Yes, Amen? Yes, yes. Nothing. But to stand up, yes, and maybe you stand up and spiritually you've got a black eye or spiritually you've lost three teeth or spiritually you've got a cracked rib or your jaw is off or, or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> but we're still moving. Amen. Amen. We're still moving. They can cut my tongue out. I can still preach. Amen. 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 Family, as long as we are breathing and there's blood flowing through our veins yes. and, 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 and we've got reasonable movement here in the gray matter. We can still build God's kingdom. It goes further. Verse 10. Let's drop down, sorry, to verse 13. It is written, I believe, therefore, I have spoken since we have the same spirit of faith. We also believe, therefore, um, therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us Amen. with Jesus and present us to him. Verse 15. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Family. The work that we are doing in God's kingdom is it causing 
not. I must work harder. Amen. Listen to what he says here. The work that we do will cause thanksgiving. They must go down on their knees at night and say, God, I don't really know how to pray. I just want to thank you for this Christian that constantly builds me up. Amen. It goes further, family. We're almost done. Verse 16. Therefore, we do not a second time lose heart. We do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. What does he mean by this? Family, if you have been in the ministry or if you are in the ministry, you will know that there's no time off. You don't get time off in the ministry. You also don't retire when you are in the ministry. You work in God's kingdom until they put you in a wooden box or until that trumpet sounds. There's no rest. And what he's saying here is outwardly, we waste away. If I did not have a good, faithful, loving, godly wife, I would never feed myself. Because I'm constantly busy with God's kingdom or his people. I just don't eat. I can go seven days straight without eating. If my wife doesn't walk into the prayer room with food and put it down next to me, I just don't eat. And what does that do to my body? Causes me to waste away. Amen? When people phone you one o'clock at night and say, my teenage daughter has just run away from home. And 15 minutes later, there's a knock on the door and it's the teenage daughter. What happens to you, family, if you don't get a good night's rest? You waste away. This is what Paul is saying. We don't mind wasting away. Outwardly, as long as inwardly we are being renewed. Because if both of that happens, we are wasting away outwardly and inwardly we are wasting away. What are we actually doing, family? And so he says, um, inwardly we are being renewed day, day by day. Verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory. Listen to what Paul says here. Our light and and momentary troubles. He says, this that we're going through now, it's small. He says, it's small, family. Every day, these Roman soldiers pull me out of the, 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 the jail cell, and they beat me to a pole. He said, that's, that's, that's light. It's, it's, it's small. Listen to what he says here. It's achieving something in our lives. What's it achieving? It's achieving eternal glory. Amen. Without persecution, family, we won't be driven to the cross of Jesus. Yes, yeah. thank you, Lord. Then, the last piece of this beautiful scripture, Amen. verse 18. He ends with, listen how he ends. He says, so. So, listen, attention. He says, family in Jesus' church, attention. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Amen. Question tonight, family. What are we fixing our eyes on? Because these days, it sounds by the way that we all talk, we are fixing our eyes on things that are seen. Yes. We are fixing our eyes on things that are physically seen. We are seeing the news reports. We are seeing the posters. We are seeing the protests. We're seeing and we're fixing our eyes on it. And what is it doing to our minds? It's blinding it. It's taking a veil and covering it. And so he says here, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary. This that we are seeing now. Family, in a blink of an eye, there will be no more posters. We don't have to scan in anywhere. This, it will be gone because there will be something new. That's, what, that's how life happens. Go back and have a look in history. It's just repeating itself. It's repeating it. And then it says here, but what is unseen is eternal. What is unseen is eternal. Family in Jesus, are we fixing our eyes tonight on what is unseen. Are we fixing our eyes on that? 
and saying, Lord Jesus, you know, yes, I, I, I am, the, Jesus said to the disciples, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. We have to live in the world, but we don't have to become like the world. And so, yes, it's a challenge, family. It is a challenge when you physically see the things and your physical eyeballs send a physical message to your physical brain that says, whoa, he has rubbish here. It's a challenge to then stand firm on the rock of Jesus and say, I fix my eyes on what is unseen. Not what is seen. I fix my eyes on what is unseen and that to the world is Jesus. They can't see him. Yes, yes. But we can. Amen? Amen. And so family, as we go into this week, let us challenge ourselves. Let us challenge ourselves to say, this week, I won't fix my eyes on what is seen. I won't let it affect me. I won't let it turn my vision. Because we all have a vision, family. We've all got a plan and a purpose. We've got a blueprint. And if that blueprint isn't blue anymore, we must make another plan. Amen? Because the unseen is the blueprint. The seen is, is, is disaster. And there's no foundation. There's sand and, and just storms and wind and rain and, and hail. It's a family. As we go out into this week, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Father God, we worship you tonight, Lord, because we know that your word is true. We know, Lord, that our brothers that went before us, that, that, that sat in, in those terrible, terrible conditions, Lord, in those prisons, that they sat and, and they, Lord, they could see the unseen. They were spending time with you in those prison cells, Lord. You were there with them. You never left them, Lord. You sat down with them in that cold, wet, dark cell. And you shone the light for them to open the scrolls and take those pens and write this beautiful word. It was you, Jesus. It was nothing and no one else, Lord. And Lord Jesus, if what we hold in our hands today manifested out of the unseen, then Lord, that is what I want to, to fix my eyes on. I want to fix my eyes on you, Lord, when I'm sitting in that prison, when I'm being persecuted, when I'm being slandered and, 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 and flogged and beaten half to death, when I am outwardly wasting away, Lord Jesus, I want to make sure that my eyes are fixed on you, the unseen Lord. Lord Jesus, there, there was a reason that you said to your disciples, don't be like these hypocrites and stand on the, 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 the corners and pray so that everybody can see them and give them praises. But go into your prayer room, your inner room, close the door and lock it and pray to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who is unseen, will reward you. Lord Jesus, we want to fix our eyes on you, Lord, the unseen. We want to fix our eyes on Jesus. We want to sit down with you, Lord, with a scroll and a pen and say, Lord, I will sit here until you talk to me. And I will write it down word for word. And I will give it to your people, Lord. I will advance your kingdom because that, Lord, is my plan and my purpose. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We worship you, Lord. You are good. You are a good, good God, Lord. We love you, Father God. Nothing, Lord, that we receive, we deserve. But we get it because of your mercy and your grace and your kindness and your goodness. So thank you for that, Father God. Lord, as we go back into worship now, I invite your people, Lord, to bow down before you and to seek your face, Lord. To seek you, Lord. If they have no reason to follow you tonight, then they must seek you even more, Lord. I pray, Father God, a time is coming 
when you said in your word will be a terrible time. I pray that we will be ready for that. I pray that we will fix our eyes on you. That we will listen to what you say to us, how to get prepared, Lord. So as we go into worship now, Lord Jesus, may we seek you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.